So he always likes something interesting. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, let's. I'm sure we'll have more people be joining us, but John, I just want to turn it over to you. John is our PM SIG leader, and he is going to be working with our guest, um, Patrick Lammers, tonight, and they're going to be having a great discussion. So excited for it. So awesome. On to you. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Seattle area at 6.02 p.m. on uh, April 13th. Uh, I am uh, really pleased to uh, introduce uh, not only uh, Patrick, but this, if you're new to the, the SIG, uh, the PM stands for Project, Program, or Product Manager, uh, Special Interest Group. And it's could uh, the topics range. Uh, uh, in any uh, kind of uh, a work stream related uh, uh, news and uh, processes and ideas around each of those three domains. Um, and tonight uh, it is program management uh, and uh, it's a really interesting topic that Patrick has offered us tonight about making a program management office from scratch. He and I worked at eBay for almost two years. Um, he since moved on to M2Gen, and, uh, which is a company here in the Seattle area, and has, uh, he has a lot of experience around agile uh, coaching and, and uh, program management, of course, of different, uh, different aspects of such, um, three of which uh, we'll cover tonight about alignment, uh, process, and priorities, uh, and even hiring. Um, so, uh, without further ado, uh, welcome Patrick Lammers. And Patrick, if you could talk at uh, for a minute or two at a high level about the the topic tonight about bootstrapping a PMO from scratch and what the essential uh, what your role is and your goal is around um, uh, this topic. Uh, sure. First, a little about me. My, my title is Director of Technical Program Management. Um, it's kind of a mouthful and I'm learning it doesn't really describe what it is that I'm doing because there's this ever growing scope that seems to be attached to my position. Um, one correction before we get too far, m to gen is actually 100% remote they started out of Florida, so there's quite a few people in the Eastern time zone, but uh, my immediate manager is here in Issaquah. There's probably three or four of us in the Seattle area. 100% um, remote company means there's no lunch hour for us because everybody's on a different cycle, um, but things get really quiet around two in the afternoon, so I can get some work done. Um, the company has been around 16 years, um, but ran out of funds, uh, did a massive reduction in force right around the time that COVID started. So a lot of the technical institutional knowledge kind of walked out the door. Um, somebody used the, the term, we're a, a rematuring company now. Even though we've been around, we've got customers, we're rehiring the technical staff. Uh, we're trying to align all of the various aspects of the company along the same set of goals. Um, when I hired in, like the title says, I was going to be program managing just the software engineering aspects of it. But I think as we did our first couple rounds, our first couple of sprints, the management saw, wow, all of the engineering staff's projects are green. Everybody else's projects are always in the red. What are they doing over there? So Patrick, can you hire more program managers and help us out to get our stuff on track? So the role is changing. Um, the fact that we had virtually zero process in place, they didn't even have a bug tracking system when I got here. So I was baffled how they knew what they were going to be working on. Um, so we're inventing from scratch, building on the fly. Um, 
I keep telling everybody we're going to iterate our way to success because I have a strong agile background. I totally believe in running quick experiments and then adjusting our course. I just need to convince everybody else at the company that this is the right way of doing it. And okay, so the first question is, speaking of implementing and convincing, uh, oh, by the way, if, if any of you in the audience has a question, just raise your hand or post something in the Q&A and, and we'll take it in line. You don't have to wait till the end. Um, so, okay, convincing everybody to do it. So how, how do you influence people who are resistant to change or, or aren't yet on board? Um, <clears throat> given where we're currently at, I mean, I, I don't think it's difficult to convince people that we need to improve. Right, we've got a lot of disconnected orgs, people trying to run their own projects that don't align with anybody else. Um, we're not unified on how we report progress. So the only way to improve is to change. There is no growth without change. Um, I'm totally fine with shaking things up. I mean, there is no long history of this is the way we've always done it around here. Um, usually I try and pitch change as experiments, right? The agile mindset again. Um, but if I can demonstrate success, you know, like we did with the, the engineering org, hey, all of our projects seem to be on track here's what we're doing, you guys, here's how we're reporting. This seems to be working. Would you like to come and join us? Eventually, if I can grow those circles out, we'll have the entire company tracking and reporting and using the tools that we've been building. Um, if somebody has a great suggestion for doing something different, I'm totally open to adopting it and seeing how it fits into our overall structure. But, you know, people have to be willing to experiment. There is no one single right way of doing anything. So let's find a way that works for most of us and then bring everybody else in. Um, so far, people are open to the idea. I do find myself conducting one-on-one -on -one training sessions on Azure DevOps with like vice president type people. Um, but if that's what it takes to get them on board, I'm fine with doing it. Yeah. Well, okay, you said two profound things. One is iterate your way to success, which sounds like it reminds me of uh, the agile notion of you start with a failed test or like test-driven development, right? And then you said, this seems to be working when you join us. So what, what have you tried? What have you experimented with? That's like totally working. Is there anything you can point to that says like it's a, it's it's actually working? Uh, worked versus working. <laughs> I I can't say anything is done and we've proven and we're never going to change it again because everything is still a work in progress. Um, I think the the one thing that I've brought to the company that I can really point to and say, wow, this is having the intended effect is just, we have one list. We have one place where we write down everything that the company is doing and it's a stack ranked list. So everything must fit in here that you can't have you know, 37 P1s, everything has to fit into a stack rank. Um, the way process has been communicated prior to my, my showing up here was communication through PowerPoint where status was generally, you know, the traffic light, red, yellow, green. And when you drilled into it, it was usually a gut check from somebody, you know, who was responsible for the program. It feels like it's going well. So I'm going to mark it as green. I have this vision of totally data-driven status reporting. So if we can get everything into a tool that builds from the bottom up, the engineers do their work, mark their work items as complete. You, you see a status of percent complete on a project that feeds up into an initiative. You can see that this initiative was 
aligned to you know Q4 2022, it seems to be roughly on track time-wise and completion-wise. So we're going to call that project good. Um, trying to convince the non-engineering staff to track their work in the same way in the same tool is one of those people resistant to change. But I think we're doing pretty good with the engineering things. We we building uh, Power BI pages now to report status that is getting a lot of really good feedback. So people are actually coming to us saying, hey, how do I get into this? So that's the best thing that's working. Some things, not so much. So when, let me um, pivot a bit to that. It, we, we've all been new on a, on a project or on a, uh, at a company. Um, how does this bootstrapping initiative that, that you're, you're um, being a, a steward of, um, how does that, how does this role compared to the last experiences you've had when you were a new PM on a project? Uh, most places, yeah, I think every other place that I've been, you have the luxury of coming in and being a fly on the wall not really making any decisions for like the first 30 days. Um, I had built this habit of, I come in and introduce myself to everybody. And then after the first two weeks or so, I set a report card. Here's the things I'm committed to delivering to you guys. And then six months down the road, I send out my own grade on my report card saying, here's the things that I thought I was going to do. Here's the things we completed. And here's the things I got an F on. Um, this bootstrapping, there, there was no meetings or process that I could sit in on and see how they're working and maybe make a few minor tweaks. There was, you know, work to be done. A couple of people who could do work people who thought they were doing work, but really couldn't prove it any place, work that management thought was getting done that I couldn't find. So just wrapping my head around all the disconnects, figuring out what rudimentary process we could put in place just to start building some momentum was really, really difficult. Uh, it didn't help that 30 days after I joined, we threw out our entire tool set and dropped a different tool in that nobody had any experience with. We moved from Jira to Azure DevOps because Emtigen is partnering with Microsoft. We got the entire Microsoft stack as part of the deal. Um, so madly Googling for, or sorry, pinging for, how do I do this in Azure DevOps? I know I can do it in Jira. How do I do it in this new tool? Um, so lots of drinking from the fire hose, um, you know, people supporting one another that, hey, I figured this thing out. Did you know you could do this thing in this tool? And finally we reached some tipping point where it started to click and made sense to people. Um, from there, I think we've been recovering a little bit because we, we went down some dead ends. We ran some experiments that weren't such great ideas, but we're now on a good path where we've got a unified project divided amongst areas with owners and the ability to report. So we're finally, I've been here seven months. We're building some momentum around this, starting to show some good results. Okay, what, what has surprised you in this bootstrapping so far? Oh, um, I'm trying to think of the good surprises, happy surprises. You know, it was pitched as, oh, yeah, we're, a, we're an agile company. We do things in an agile fashion. So when I got here, there were four engineers. So we formed a scrum team. And I said, OK, this is our backlog. We have work that needs to be done. We need to do a sprint planning session. And I got blank looks. Um, 
they said, oh, we've never done this. Explain what doing sprint planning means. So we, we stumbled our way through our first one. I went out to their Confluence site and I dug up you know, documents that were years old that described, here's how we do Agile at Emptigen, the entire SDLC testing, everything's all documented. And I brought those documents back and showed them around and they're like, we've never seen this. Well, I have, we have no idea what you're doing. Um, so I bootstrapped some of the, the engineers, the four engineers that we had, they picked up on it right away. But then I realized the stakeholders and management had no idea what agile development means. So I've been doing scrum training classes for the people below the people to my side and the people above. I mean, I've done, um, how to engage with an agile engineering or to the executive leadership team, just so they know what to expect. It's, it was very eye-opening that all of our stakeholders said, I described what I wanted. I wrote a document. Six months later, when it got delivered, it wasn't what I had asked for. And I'm like, oh my God, you, you were disengaged for six months and you're surprised you didn't get what you expected? Let me show you how this is supposed to work. You come to this meeting every two weeks. You tell us what we're going to be building for you. Then we show it to you and you tell us whether or not we did it right. And we get this fast feedback cycle build, building here. So I think they're a little surprised at the amount of engagement that we're expecting. But I think they're going to be happy that we never go off into the weeds, at least not very far, because we have that fast engagement. Um, as I said, it's just starting to come together. You caught me at a, the time where I can say it looks good. I hope it continues. When, when you were learning Agile, I'm sure the light bulbs went off when you started to learn about certain ceremonies or notion of a Kanban or planning poker or, or retrospective. Or I know what they did for me, but did, have you seen any light bulbs? go off in the people that are under you when you describe some of these ceremonies or nomenclature or principles of Agile? Um, I've had a couple people push back and surprisingly, it's the really super experienced people. Like, well, the way we typically do it is we need our Gantt chart and we need milestones. We need deliverables and hard dates and the critical path through the system so that we can plan. Um, and I've had to point out that, you know, I've never seen that work particularly well. We know the least amount about the project on day one, when you want, want us to put together the plan and all the milestones, that's when we don't know anything yet. Every day we learn a little bit more. So we should be adjusting our plan as we learn. If you take that all the way to its logical conclusion, we should plan just a little bit at a time, execute on it, and then plan the next little increment. And even though we may wander a little bit off of our final destination, I think it's way more optimized than shooting a dart at a, at a point 18 months or two years down the road and hoping like hell that we hit it. Um, Yeah, I hope that answered your question. I think I lost track of what you actually asked. Well, the, the, so the question was about the light bulbs and epiphanies that go oh, off when you bring it. Yeah. Um, when I explain it to people that uh, Agile is really simple. You want to work on the most important thing, the, the biggest pain point, and address that. And while you're busy working on that, another pain point may come in behind it that's completely different than what you thought you were going to be doing. So shift gears and attack the next thing. Keep doing that. Um, I, I had this discussion with our CEO just this week that he, he wanted to make sure we're doing things as efficiently as possible. We should design what we're going to build up front so that we can touch each piece of software one time and you know build things efficiently. I tried to 
instill in him this alternate definition of efficiency that we have a process right now that has a bunch of bottlenecks. If we can pick the biggest bottleneck and eliminate it or reduce it, then our whole system flows a little bit faster, but we find a different bottleneck somewhere else in the system. So we'll run over and deal with that one. It doesn't mean we won't come back to this first bottleneck and touch this particular set of code again and again and again. We may touch it and refactor it 10 times once every sprint. But it's efficient in that we're always dealing with the thing that is in the worst shape in any given sprint. It's just, it's, it's still efficient. It's just a different definition of efficiency. Um, I hope he got it. <laughs> well, there's, we all have stuff in our intellectual briefcase that we bring to work from our past roles and stuff we invent and experiment with to your point uh, on the job. Is there any uh, collateral you've brought in from some of the celebrities per se, you know, in, in the agile community, uh, Pope and Dyke about constraints or, um, uh, or gold rats uh, constraints, uh, um, uh, anything about uh, requirements from like Uyghurs, you know, Carl Uyghurs or, or uh, Martin Fowler, or, is there anything that, that resonated with you when you were learning Agile that you, to this day, you'd be like, you guys got to read this? Yeah. Um, I think the book is the, the Golden Chain or the Chain. It's a, I believe it's a gold rack book, but it's the, the constraints, the whole constraints thing. Um, constraints is a big issue right now where I'm currently at. Uh, we don't have a product org at the moment. So in lieu of a, you know, a single product guy or a product team, we have what we call product council, where we've brought in, uh, you know, the VPs or the stakeholders from all the divisions across the company. Everybody pitches what they think is, you know, their next piece of work or the most important piece of work. Um, and then if it is interesting, if we feel it's justified that the company should be investing in it, we will send it off to engineering for discovery so they can do a little bit of probing and, you know, the architects can take a look at it, maybe come back with, we think it's this approach. We think one scrum team, three sprints, we could deliver something, you know, plus or minus 50%. Um, but every single stakeholder VP comes to product council and says, this is the most important thing that the company should be working on right now. And we go, yes, you're right. That is super important. We should get on that. We think it goes way out here because all this other stuff is even more important and we're already booked. So convincing them that we are very resource constrained. Um, maybe instead of saying, here's this giant body of work, I want it all, you should come to us with, I want it all, but I really, really need this one piece because a small, super important piece is way easier for us to slot in to the roadmap someplace. So if everybody could get into that mindset of give us just your burning issue, scope it down as small as possible, and we can iterate on these quickly. Everybody gets their number one thing done. Most people get their number two thing. Some of us will get their number three thing. And we will build up some speed here. Um, still kind of fighting this battle with the whole product council. I think a lot of people view it as, oh, it's my turn to pitch what's important. And they zone out. They're not debating amongst each other over what do we agree is the important thing for the company to do. Um, you know, we've held the meeting three times now, so we're, we're bootstrapping still. Um, I think it'll get there. I, I hope it'll get there. We'll iterate our way to success. As, as new people join, and this is one of the bullet items in the, on the PM uh, dash sig.org website was is about hiring and bringing new people on into this structure that you're bootstrapping into 
into notions of prioritization and backlog with product council and, and regular meetings to decide like what's the best business value in the next you know, quarter. Um, when, as you hire people, as new people come on board, um, how, do you, how do you solve that problem of, of how they're distributed like carefully or, or smartly? Um, to date, it's been pretty obvious. I mean, um, we have huge needs everywhere. Um, it's probably, I'm a little bit selfish. It's the thing that has been distracting me from my quote unquote real job, where I'm filling in as program manager on some big initiative. And I really need somebody to take this off my plate. Um, so we hire somebody, get them up to speed, and then they own that piece of it. Um, one of the first tasks for product council was you know, trying to assemble everything that we think we're working on into that one master list so that we can sort it into priority order. The first cut at that exercise gave us like 58 things that we thought we should be working on or we already are working on. And I'm still discovering. There's one guy that just came to me and said, oh yeah, here's all the stuff that I think my org is doing that isn't tracked anywhere that I can see. So, you know, there is a need for one, possibly two more program managers just to deal with his stuff. Um, we have these constant debates about, you know, you talked about at the very beginning, the P stands for project program product. Um, the roles aren't very clearly defined here at m to gen I think because we're rematuring, it's a lot of everybody wears multiple hats, run around and do whatever needs to get done. It's a startup mentality. So as we start to flesh out a little bit, people are starting to step back and say, well, that's really not a program manager's job. I'm program management. So somebody else needs to take on this responsibility. I don't know. I, I feel like I'm still much more in the startup mentality where work needs to get done, help me do it. Um, if you're in the best position or you have the skills or the knowledge, please contribute. Um, but then again, I worked until nine o'clock last night, so maybe I'm not the best person to draw boundaries. What what's getting up in the in the bootstrapping now in these these uh, long days? What is it? A, what's getting your time in terms of the the meta vision and the micro like boots on the ground every day? What in, if you were to give me a percentage of of the split of day to day execution versus high level vision? What percentage would that be with your time split between the big direction and the day to day execution? Um. I would probably say, you know, a month ago, it was 75% big vision, um, you know, dreaming up product council, dreaming up the process. What are the various stages that an Epic needs to go through? What are the detailed steps? You know, what, what does it mean to conduct discovery? What is, what is the minimum bar? What's the delivery items that come out of discovery? Um, there was a lot of thinking and planning what the process should be and, you know, outlining things and running it past people. Um, I don't remember the exact quote, but, you know, battle plans never survived their first contact with the enemy. So rolling out the process, we thought it was going to be gorgeous. And all of a sudden, people started using it in ways that we hadn't expected. So rapidly tweaking. Um, the other part that's shifted for me, you know, once we rolled out that process, we started having to fix it. And we're also getting very, very close to wrapping up our migration from AWS to Azure, which is my first project. So I'm up to my eyeballs, making sure that's going smoothly. You know, just trying to wrangle all the various moving parts so we all align on that cutover date. So right now it's 80% day-to-day -day micromanaging. 
I really don't have time to think about the big picture at the moment. But if you, to your point, if you iterate your way to success, that's okay. You're firing the missile and you're making course corrections toward that bigger vision with a sense from your gut, perhaps, of where you need to be. Uh, so it, it does make sense, like the, uh, the notions of agility about um, a reaction and uh, re responding to change over following a plan is one of the things in the manifesto, right? It sounds like th that's what you're bringing in, not this briefcase full of procedures that say, no, we have to follow these guys. Um, you're coming in with this notion of context uh, and responding to context first. Like the notion of a product council is really cool. Like I think I, I that would be in my briefcase, like from now on, if I were to have a role like this where you're bootstrapping, I'd be like, okay, we need a, some notion of a product council. So where did, where did, that, where did that idea come from? And because uh, it sounds like it's kind of a staple now of the culture that's serving a, a really good purpose. I think it came about because, um, you know, I, I might have mentioned this or not, but the, the CEO started right around the same time I did. Um, they had engaged a consulting firm to basically do 360 degree market analysis what does Mtogen have as their strength? What are the competitors? Where are our gaps? What should we work on for the next six months? So basically, he and I both started around the same time. We were given this package of here's six months worth of work. Start turning the crank and let's deliver on some of these things. About four months in, I started realizing, wow, there's nothing beyond that. There's no backlog. You know, whose responsibility is it to be filling out the next six months worth of work? Um, because we had no product org and I could see us coming to the end of the line, we're cutting to the bottom of our stack rank. I started making noise about who's the decider? How do we, how do we get more things? How do we prioritize this? Um, We've been looking for a while now around hiring a chief product officer, um, still looking. So if anybody knows any, send them my way. Um, but lacking a product org who helps us shape the roadmap, we all had things that we knew needed to be done. So the idea of, hey, let's convene a council of elders and we will, arm wrestle amongst ourselves and decide what goes on the priority list. Um, it's an idea that my boss and I had kicked around. He picked out the, the members and we launched it. Um, I keep wondering if we end up hiring a chief product officer, do we just blow this up? Does it go away? Um, and I don't think it does. I think um, instead of having a meeting that I run and we look at all the incoming uh, epics and programs that get proposed, maybe the product officer meets with all these stakeholders, either in a group or one-on-one, -on -one, and that person is responsible for synthesizing the priorities and then can just feed them to engineering, feed them to me in program management world and say, Here's our marching orders. Here's the order we expect to see things go. Um, hopefully we're in that picture a little bit because sometimes engineering says, well, the order you've got here really doesn't make sense. It's easier if we do it the other way around. You know, this depends on something that we don't have yet. So we have to be in that picture, but I would be fine if our next hire was product chief product officer who took over that responsibility. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a nice uh, pivot to, to my next question actually is, um, in terms of retrospectives, you, you've had some time on the job, six, seven months, and let's say we do a retrospective and, um, and I sit you down and I say, uh, okay, Patrick, um, there's a notion of start, stop, keep, which you may have heard before and maybe even used in retrospectives. Um, what would you keep? If you were to do it all over again, and this is now your first day is tomorrow, knowing everything you know now, what would you keep? Would it be the product council? Would it be some notion of um, uh, document archaeology <laughs> that is, you know, where all the bones are buried now and acquainting people with that? Tell me, like, what, 
what kind of things would you want to just keep doing? Um, I think the the big thing, I don't know if you call this keep or, you know, knowing what I know now, I would probably say, uh, don't be timid. Um, because I was new, most of the companies knew, um, the tools were all new, the technology was new. We spent a lot of time researching, well, what's the best path to go down? What's the proper way of doing X or Y with this new system? Um, and like I said, the, the plans don't survive first contact or first execution. So pick a direction and start moving in that direction. Don't get caught up in analysis paralysis. Um, and it, it's kind of that whole iterate your way to success didn't crop up in my conversation nearly as much until I landed in this position where, I forget what that term is, uh, people are gonna discover that I really don't know what the hell I'm doing. But if I keep moving fast enough, maybe I can learn what I'm doing before they figure that out. Yeah. Yeah, the, the imposter syndrome versus, uh, I think it's the opposite, it's called Dunning-Kruger effect, where somebody thinks they're the expert on everything and they're screwing everything up. Uh, so it's, um, uh, it's about humility and learning versus you know, my way or the highway. And it sounds like in this role, um, your personality, your willingness to try things, to influence people in a, in a way that meets them where they're at, uh, that is respectful yet that firm, like you have a you have a vision, you have an idea, you have a point of view. That sounds like it's a really good set of soft skills for this particular role or any bootstrapping role where you come into a new environment with other people who are new, perhaps other people who have been there a long time, and you've got to find a way to influence people to take this journey with you in this direction uh, on your remit. Um, so would you say that in the last few months, it's been more of the soft skills than the hard skills? Uh, definitely the soft skills. I mean, all of the hard skills that I use day to day, I think I've learned here at Mtgen because, you know, I, based on my past, I know what's possible. I don't know how to do it with the tool set or the, you know, the technology that this company is trying to use this is my first time in a uh what is the term uh i'm drawing a complete blank it's a regulated industry that's right we're dealing with electronic health records so we have to comply with you know federal government bylaws um totally new to me but um i know what's possible and then do a little bit of research, be persistent, you know, keep pursuing the end goal. And I think we'll eventually get there. Um, there's some people that say, oh, yeah, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And to that, I always respond, yet. I don't know yet. <laughs> well done, well done. Give me yeah. a sprint. Yeah, give me or a spike, right? It's an experiment. We don't know until we know. And yeah. I think that's why they pick sprints because two weeks, if you totally screw it up, you've lost two weeks, big deal. And if you commit for six months and you screw up, that's a, that's a big deal. So someone came up with the notion that two weeks is about right. Long enough to get something done, short enough that we can refactor and redirect if we screw up. And so do you find that, uh, are you in like a two week like sprint cadence or a notion of development in these short iterations? Um. For the couple of scrum teams that we've got, yes, they're, we've aligned on a two-week cadence across the company just to try and keep everybody aligned. Um, the one large team that we've got is kind of gated by migrating things to Azure. So software delivery is a lot more about you know building bicep 
documentation so that you can deploy networking, networking as a service, that kind of thing. We're not shipping code yet. We're laying the groundwork so that we can ship the code. Um, as soon as Azure shows up, it, since it's a lift and shift, it'll, it'll function just the way it did on AWS. Once we can prove that it works, now we start ripping it apart. So we've, we've been investing a lot in being able to move fast and deliver quickly once we get there. And we are five weeks from turning it on. Um, yeah, I think the teams that are trying to ship on a two week cycle, they don't always have something that is ready for consumers, ready for customers to try out. There's a lot of times where they've uh, overestimated. So we're trying to track like a team velocity or a say do ratio and help them realize, you know, uh, over promising and under delivering is bad, but so is the opposite. What we really would like you guys to be able to do is size a body of work that's roughly two weeks worth of work and then be able to deliver on it. Because if we can count on you guys to be able to make those kind of estimates, now we can start to predict the future. You know, we can go two or three sprints out. So when somebody's asking about a feature, we say it looks like end of June, you'll have it unless something comes up. Because you've got a baseline of experience now that you didn't have before. Yeah. And you know the fact that we are constantly changing the teams because we're constantly bringing in new people, mm -hmm. um, it, it kind of screws up our velocity. But we'll get there. Yeah. You, you mentioned a really interesting thing that's, that's pervasive in, in software development about an analysis paralysis. Uh, cer a certain amount of due diligence is necessary to analyze. Uh, but then you have to like make a decision and, and move. Um, do you have like a heuristic or a rule of thumb around how much analysis that you're comfortable with before you, you know, have to raise a flag and say, okay, guys, um, let's just light the candle and, and do this for two weeks. H how much analysis do you find um, like generally that is prudent before you act? Um. I, the cheesy answer is it depends. Sure. Um, yeah. Usually, yeah. if we, if there's something that we're about to do that can easily be undone, then don't don't spend a whole lot of time analyzing it because you know don't spend two weeks yeah. understanding something that we can just flip the switch back the other way. For the big stuff, that's you know a one-way valve we once we start down that path there's no turning back then we need to understand it very very well um i always try and instill in everybody in my org that the only penalty for screwing something up is that you have to learn something from this exercise um i'm a big believer in retrospectives you know, root cause analysis or after action, whatever you want to call them, we should be able to learn from other people's dead ends, let's say, not mistakes, um, but spread the knowledge, you know, make the mistake, learn from it, let everybody else know, hey, that wasn't a great idea, we should do this other thing instead. And then towards that end, another thing that I'm finding is not part of the culture around here is document what you've decided. You know, we have this work items that have a discussion thread attached, document what you're doing. And if we choose not to do it anymore, write down why we aren't doing this anymore. Then your bug tracking or backlog tracking system becomes this huge knowledge base. People can search it for keywords and see, did we ever do this in the past? Oh, here's why we didn't do that. Here's when we made that change. Here's who decided that. When something gets closed as fixed and it has no pull request attached to it, I always wonder, did we really do anything? How do you prove that we actually did this work? Um, if we didn't do it, why didn't we do it? 
why did we invest in creating this tracking item and then close it? I don't know if it got done or it got abandoned or what. So document what we're talking about. And I think I drive people a little bit nuts that I'm constantly in the work items, asking questions and poking people. Um, I would much rather have the conversation take place there in Azure DevOps instead of an inbox that other people can never see. So I'm trying to lead by example. Um, maybe yeah. I'm driving people crazy. I don't know. I think when I work with you, you caused a, a profound change uh, in the way I approached my my role. You, uh, I used to say I'm nagging people, and you, I think you suggested nudge. That's not yes, we were nagging them, but we were more like, hey, don't forget this. What's the status of this? Just a quick little impulse. Um, it's like it's like a, a stick of dynamite is inert, but when you put the the detonator on it, it's just a little explosion that creates the bigger explosion. So sometimes we're just that little detonator that that provokes uh, action. Um, yeah. I think that's one of the takeaways that I got with working with you is is like psychosocially, I don't want to be seen as a nag. I want to be seen as a nudge. And do you find that that's useful where you're at too? One of the things that uh, I actually picked up from your Dawn Patrol everyday meetings is I have a series of uh, Azure DevOps now queries, Jira queries back then, but I have this whole series of queries that basically say, you know, what's gone stale? What is in the active state that hasn't been touched in the last seven days? Uh, what things have a target date on them that are now in the past? Um, how many new issues did we get in the last 24 hours? So somebody ran a tool and dumped 97 new tickets on us. Holy crap, we need to know about that. What just happened? So every morning, first thing I do when I sit down is I run through my, my radar systems and say, what's going on in the world? What do I need to go push people on or alert people to? Um, and they all think, wow, he's really on top of this. I'm like, no, well, I know how to write a query. I got in the habit of running my query over and over again. I really don't read every single item every single morning, guys. Awesome. Okay. Um, all right. Last question. Before I ask the question, let me let me sum up. Um, so in this whole idea of bootstrapping, your advice is document what you decide, make small steps. Frequent engagement instead of every six months and a document lingers and it's out of date. So frequent engagement, iterate your way to success. Notions of a product council for alignment, notion of retrospectives or after action uh, uh, meetings. Uh, don't be timid. Uh, look at, use Jira queries to see what's gone stale. Keep that, keep that nudge going. Have one list, everything that the company is doing in a stacked rank list and there is no growth without change. So a lot of profound, relevant, meaningful, actionable advice uh, when you're swimming in a sea of change and uncertainty uh, and unknown. Um, these are things that, that I, I resonate with that have worked for me. I think it's, it may resonate with some of our audience. Uh, so and the last question is, with all of the stuff and advice you've given us in your experience in this role, uh, what would create the biggest feeling of success for you in this role? Uh, but virtue of everything that you're doing? Huh. Uh, grow the company 10x, cash out all my options and retire to the beach someplace? Um, probably the, the serious answer is um, just seeing that some of these practices and policies that I put into place persist and grow across the org. Um, you know, if if we do bring in a product, the chief product officer, if they continue using the tools and the patterns that we'd set up and they just basically take it over and keep running it, that'll be a huge win. If we can expand from not just the engineering teams, but get the business teams to also track their work in the same system so we can all report it in the same way. I think that would be a huge win. Um, 
I love spinning up processes that continue on their own. You get kind of this flywheel effect and you, you have a magnifier where all you're doing is running around giving it a little spin every single time. I can keep a lot of projects like that going where if I'm the only one driving, I can do one project at a time. So seeing that multiplier effect keep going across the org and having ripple ripples that expand outward, I think would be a huge success. I would, yeah. I would give myself a huge bonus for that. <laughs> well, that was a, that's a good answer. All right, thank you, Patrick. Uh, let me up the, open up the, the forum uh, here live to, uh, to questions. Uh, there are some attendees. And, uh, so if anything top of mind, uh, you'd like to ask, uh, fire away either in the uh, Q&A uh, section or chat or raise hand or whatever, anything that uh, you'd like to ask about bootstrapping or digital experience. Shy people? Shy people. Or maybe you covered everything so well. Yeah. <laughs> well, Patrick said it would be, uh, you know, t two hours to go through seven questions. We did uh, 15 questions in 45 minutes, which, so nice job, Patrick. You you thwarted my best attempts to make this a two-hour meeting. Um, and we're, we're well, right. I don't know that you hit all of the seven questions that you shot. Oh, I did. I well, one. I think I missed. I missed one, but I pivoted to a, a question I thought was you had you had answered in a really good way. So, but, but yeah, we covered that and and the bullet items on as we promised on, on PM sigorg dot uh, org about alignment. Um, uh, okay, so if uh, are you open to uh, uh, people who uh, look at this, uh, watch this recording, and and um, want to contact you on LinkedIn, perhaps is that uh, you don't have to give in your email, but uh, you open to connections and people oh, say, sure. tell me more. Yeah, LinkedIn. Um, okay. I was going to say not the M to Jen email alias because I get a lot of spam there and it just it goes to the bit bucket. Yeah, sure. But yeah, LinkedIn totally open. Um, now that I know about this forum, I will probably be in the audience for the next one. Oh, great! Yeah, I, that would be uh, that'd be fun. You, you, as as you were answering one of the questions, you uh, you caused an idea that I that I want to run by uh, as a as a potential uh, idea for the SIG, where it's like real time consulting that we could have with a with a program manager or agile coach, where the coach and the coachee have a real session. And we just watched that unfold. I know a few agile coaches, and it'd be fun to, to for people like uh, you and me, especially we we program management agile kind of geeks, uh, to watch uh, somebody who really needs help with a with a problem. Uh, like, hey, I need, I just came to this new company. I need to totally build a PMO from scratch. <laughs> so, where do I start? Uh, that'd be one. Yeah, if you uh, had an agile coach that I could pay by the hour just to solve a couple of problems i might sign up for that yeah like i could use a, some fun a la carte, an a la carte menu yeah, yeah. just like i like uh, a number 14 and a number 21 and uh with extra extra um side order ties in with rice with rice awesome all right uh well shelly i'm uh that's great uh thanks for um being the uh, our our um uh, Q and A Maven behind the scenes, and uh, I uh, we can close the the recording again. Thank you, Patrick, for being our, our guest tonight. Uh, a lot of great answers to to the questions that we posed for you, and uh, we I am always open to uh, new speaker ideas uh, for the SIG, um, and also a pitch for QA SIG, which is every odd month. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing. So, uh, any other thoughts, Shelley, before we close? Yeah, I just want to thank Patrick so much for your time tonight. That was really interesting. There was a lot of nuggets I wrote little notes about that I can use in my daily stuff too. So I really appreciate that. Um, also, 
this we are, we are trying to grow the PM6, so if you enjoyed what you saw tonight or some previous one, you know, please do invite your friends, you know, share. If you have any ideas of things that you want to add to this forum, um, we are totally open to it, as you just heard from John, so you can reach out to him via LinkedIn. And we also do the QA6, so love to have you to join us. Awesome. So thanks, everyone, for your time tonight. really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you next okay. time. All right. Have a great night. Bye. Bye.